chapter 4, Ezra chapter 4, where we'll be this morning. We're not going to work through the entirety of it, as you'll see, because I started getting into it and just realized that was going to be too much to try to do in one day. So we are going to look at Ezra 4 over two weeks, which will be this week, and then Pastor Russ will be preaching next week, so it'll be the week following that we get into the next part of Ezra 4. But if you are looking for a good... Well, I don't know if it's good, but it's a title. If you're looking for a title, the title of this sermon is Opposition to the City. Opposition to the City, part one. <laughs> part two to come. So that's what we got. And uh, if you've got your Bible, we're going to go ahead and start by reading the text together today in Ezra chapter 4. And we're going to read actually from Ezra 4 down through verse 5, and then we're going to skip the rest of the chapter, and go to verse 24. Now, let me just give you a reason why we're doing that. Uh, Because the way that Ezra, who I believe organized all this and wrote all this, the way that he organized this passage, uh, you should view verses 6 all the way to verse 23 as having brackets. Because he inserts that as kind of an idea to apply what he's trying to get at to his modern-day readers. And so he's not working within a typical timeline here. He's actually telling a story of something that happened in the past um, to set the scene, and then he does kind of a bracket and shows this is what's happening in our day, and that's the letter to Artaxerxes. And then he finishes by going back to the previous bit that he was referring to in verses 1 to 5 in verse 24. So that's why this week we're just going to take verses 1 to 5 and then skip down to verse 24. That will be our text for this morning. So let's read this together. Ezra 4. This is the word of the Lord. And when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel, which, by the way, anytime you see the Lord in all caps, that's referring to the personal name of God, Yahweh. So I'm just going to use the word Yahweh from here on out, and you understand why we're using that word. They approached Zerubbabel and the heads of fathers' houses and said to them, Let us build with you, for we worship your God as you do, and we have been sacrificing to him ever since the days of Eshar, of Eshar, of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Yeshua, and the rest of the heads of fathers' houses in Israel said to them, You have nothing to do with us in building a house to our God, but we alone will build to Yahweh, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build and bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Skip to verse 24. Then the work, the work on the house of God that is in Jerusalem stopped and it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Let's pray together. Father, um, I believe in the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, and I need the Holy Spirit's help right now. And we all do. Holy Spirit, please come and enlighten the eyes of our hearts so that we can see who God is. We want to know you, God. We don't want to be forced to try to understand you by our own conception, by our own reasoning. We just want to see it in your word. So God, I pray that we would see who you are, Yahweh. That's who you are, the one and only God, 
make yourself clear to us this morning. Make yourself clear to your people afresh this morning so that we can give glory to you. And I ask that you would make yourself clear to those who are not yet your people this morning, that they might give glory to you for the first time in their lives. Right here, right now, this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In the world, you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus says those words to his disciples in John 16, 33. And then he goes on to pray for his disciples. And as he prays, he says in John 17, verse 14, I have given them your word. He's talking about his disciples. He's praying to the Father. He's saying, I've given them your word. And the world has hated them. Because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them, or make them holy in the truth. Your word is truth. Have you known troubles in this life, church? Have you known tribulations? Are you experiencing troubles even now? The Bible is clear again and again that our lives as God's people will not be easy. The prosperity gospel that's propounded by so many false prophets is a myth. Jesus doesn't save you. So so that you can be healthy and wealthy and happy in this world and the things of this world and in this life. In fact, the world that we live in is called the dominion of Satan in Ephesians chapter 2. We see that Satan has some measure of power over this world to seek after the people of God, to thwart the purposes of God, to try to steal and kill and destroy in whatever way that he can. He is a real and present enemy in this world and in your life. So you'd better believe that the people of God, including us, are going to experience the effects of the enemy and his efforts in this world. We have an enemy church. And the enemy is constantly working against the people of God, building the city of God. He's using people who are not devoted to the worship of Yahweh, the one true God. He's using people to thwart the advance of his kingdom, both in your own life, in this very church, in this very city, and throughout the entire world. And that opposition is what we see present in our text this morning. See, up to this point in Ezra, things have been pretty great, if you haven't noticed. We started by seeing the miraculous deliverance of Israel out of Babylon and back into the promised land, something that they could have never seen being a possibility. And we know that that was miraculous because, as we looked at in the first week, God prophesied through through the prophet Isaiah that he was going to raise up a man named Cyrus, a hundred years before Cyrus was even born, said, I'm going to raise up a guy named Cyrus, and he's going to deliver my people back into the promised land. It was a miraculous work of God that he delivers them out of captivity and back into his place where they can live as his people under his rule. We see his power at work. God works through rulers. He works through kings. No No king in this world, no person in power in this world is exercising their power outside of the sovereign hand of God. Sorry, we've got a, we're trying our, some headphones for the first time that are translating into another language. So if you hear something weird, that's why. And then in chapter two, we, we saw the people of God under the banner of Yahweh, joyfully coming up out of Babylon to Jerusalem, where they worked together to 
rebuild the altar of worship and the foundation of the temple. And they're gathering around this altar, lifting their voices in praise to God, saying he's doing a work, he's doing something incredible. They're worshiping their king. There's a sense in which it would be really nice if Ezra just ended on the high note right there with the people gathered around the altar, praising his name, singing to him, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. That would be our typical Disney happy ending where we all walk away with warm fuzzies in our stomachs and say, man, that was a good story, but that's not where the story ends, is it? Chapter 3 gives us this joyful shouting unto the Lord, and look how chapter 4 begins. Chapter 4 begins by directing our attention toward the enemies of God's people. It's as if the people of the land heard the shouting going up from the people of Israel and realized something's happening there that needs to be stopped right now. Perhaps they thought that these Israelites were were really getting stuff done. We didn't think they were going to be able to get this foundation laid. We didn't see this happening so quickly. It's actually happening. Things are going on, and power is being deferred from us into their hands. We need to do something to try to stop these people from worshiping their God because it's a threat to us and our way of life. So from this point on, we see in Ezra and Nehemiah the returned exiles facing hurdle after hurdle in the task of rebuilding Jerusalem. The first hurdle that we come to is the opposition from those who are the enemies of God. We're going to move through this text first by considering who the enemies of the city are. And then we're going to look at the efforts that these enemies put forth to hinder the work of God. So first, let's learn about these enemies of the city. The enemies of the city versus 1 to 3 is where we meet the enemies of the city. And the first thing to notice in these verses is that Ezra, who I believe is the author of this book, notes right away that they are adversaries of Judah and Benjamin. He starts off not by even giving them the benefit of the doubt. He says, no, they are adversaries. And the reason that he is pointing to them as enemies off the bat is because he is looking back in history with a knowledge of how these enemies continue to act in the in the returned exiles trying to rebuild Jerusalem he sees in the past how they tried again and again to to thwart those efforts and so he knows from being able to look back that these are in fact the enemies of God though they may not present themselves as such at the beginning Ezra's making a theological point in this passage he's not giving us a chronological history In the way that we might expect, he's making a point to encourage the people of his day to continue standing strong against the adversaries, against the enemies of God, to overcome because just like these Israelites in the old days overcame the enemies, so the people in the present will overcome the enemies as well. The point is, God has delivered his people from the enemies before, and he will deliver them again. We have some important truths to learn from studying these enemies of the people of God this morning. Now, that's what I want to spend some time doing. Who are these enemies? And how does Ezra understand these enemies? How does he define them? Why? What makes them the enemies of God? And the first thing that I think we should note is that these enemies are religious pluralists. The enemies are religious pluralists. Some of you may not know what that means. Religious pluralism is just the belief that all religions are equally valid. All paths lead to God. So worship whoever you want to worship. Do what works for you. It's all going to lead to God in the end anyways. That's what these religious pluralists believe. Look in verse 2. Look at how they approach Zerubbabel. And they try to convince him, let us build the house of the of the God that you and we worship him too. Let us build this house together. They they tell the true people of God, let us build with you. We worship your God as you do, and we've been sacrificing to him ever since the days of Esherdan, the king of Assyria, who brought us here. In other words, the, the enemies come to the Israelites, and they tell them, we're the same. We're just like you. 
We worship your God. We sacrifice to your God. So let us help you. And on the surface, this seems like a generous offer, doesn't it? I mean, just think about this. Surely, this small number of returned exiles who had come back from Babylon, and we saw in chapter 2 that they were nowhere near as big as even the first exodus. This is a very small number of people. Surely they would have said, man, some help would be really nice. I mean, we've got to move all these cedars of Lebanon and get them set in their place. Some strong hands would be nice for some help there. We've got to move all these stones and build this foundation. Some help might be nice there. I mean, help us get it from point A to point B. There's no harm in that, right? But instead of saying, sure, sure, c come on and help us. Look what the people of Israel tell them in verse 3. You have nothing to do with us in building a house to our God. But we alone will build to Yahweh, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Here's the everlasting principle in this text, church. The work of God is the responsibility of the true worshipers of God. The work of God is the responsibility of God's true people. Or to put it another way, if you aren't worshiping Yahweh and Yahweh alone, then you have no place in the building of the city of God. Now, I want to be clear here. You are invited to be a part of the building of the city of God. Every person is invited to be a part of the real building of the real city of the real God. But before you can pick up a stone and begin any part of the work, you need to be an official citizen of the city. You see, just how the United States, and of course this isn't a perfect illustration, but go with me. Just as in the United States or in most countries that you go to, you need some sort of proof, a green card here to prove a legitimacy that would allow you to get an official on the record job just like that's the case when you come into another country in this world so it is with the city of God before you can participate in the building of God's kingdom you need to be a citizen of his kingdom and the way that you become a citizen of his kingdom is to know him and to love him to love Yahweh the one true God with your whole heart and soul and mind and strength. And until you do that, you have no part in the building of the city. Why? Well, as we saw last week in chapter 3, the soul of the city of God, the, the thing that makes the city of God tick, the thing that the city of God gathers around and treasures above everything else is the worship of God. So if you don't have that right, then you don't have any place in the work of building the city. And the enemies in this text did not worship Yahweh. Now you may be sitting to yourself, if you're a good student of the word and you're looking at the text right there, you may be sitting there thinking, well, how do you know, pastor? I mean, from the text, it looks like they do. They say they worship Yahweh. They sacrifice to Yahweh. So who do these leaders of Judah think that they are to be so harsh to these seemingly good-hearted people? And Ezra, thankfully, gives us a hint in the text. Because he notes that these people are the people who settled in the land in the days of Esarhaddon, the king of Assyria. And the Jewish leader or the Jewish reader of this text or the listener to what's being read would have immediately understood who these people are just by that little reference there. And so we need to know who these people are as well so that we can know what is going on here and why these people are being turned away from building the city of God. Turn with me to 2 Kings 17. And that's just a couple of uh, books behind where you're at right now, 2 Kings 
chapter 17. And this is where we're going to meet and learn who these people are that we're talking about here in this chapter. So 2 Kings 17, and we're just going to read from verses 29 to 33. But before we read this text, let me just set the stage here briefly. This is an account here in 2 Kings of what happened in Israel, the northern kingdom, after Assyria captured them. And so after capturing the region of Samaria and Israel, the king of Assyria deported many Jews to Samaria, or he deported many Jews back to Assyria, and he actually brought many Assyrians into Samaria, which was part of the land of Israel at the time. So he's taking the Jewish people out, and he's bringing these Assyrian people in to settle the land that used to belong to the people of Israel. And so the people who are settling in Samaria at this point were, were pagan worshipers. They worshipped the Assyrian gods. And after a few years in the land that they had settled in, things were not going well for them. They had like lions attacking them and all sorts of crazy stuff. And so they think to themselves, well, maybe this is because we're not worshiping the God that the people who lived here used to worship. And so he's mad at us. And the text actually gives a hint that that is what, in fact, is going on. And so the people say, well, let's bring in a priest. Let's bring in a Levite from this people who can teach us how we can kind of appease this God by sacrificing to him in hopes that this Yahweh God would start to show them favor. So the people are taught the law, the law of God. And look what they do with it. This is so important. 2 Kings 17, 29 to 33. But every nation, this is after they've been taught the law of God. But every nation still made gods of its own. And put them in the shrines of the high places that the Samaritans had made. Every nation in the cities in which they lived. The men of Babylon made Succoth Banath, the men of Cuth made Nergoth, the men of Hamath made Ashima, and the Avites made Nibhaz and Tartuf. And the Shepherdites burned their children in the fire of Adramelech and Anamelech, and the gods of of, uh, Seravim. They also, now look at this, so devastating, verse 32. They also feared Yahweh and appointed from among themselves all sorts of people as priests of the high places who sacrificed, who sacrificed for them in the shrines of the high places. So they feared Yahweh, but also served their own gods after the manner of the nations from among whom they had been carried away. So now we have the fuller picture, don't we, of who these people are. These people who surround Jerusalem, even in Ezra's day, during the time of Zerubbabel, before Ezra, and and onward, are people who claim to worship Yahweh, but he's not their one and only true God. Really, Yahweh is more of just a side worship gig that is only included so that they can try to avoid the ramifications that might come from his anger. Here's the point, church. These people don't worship Yahweh. And they don't worship Yahweh because they don't understand Yahweh. What they do is they turn Yahweh into a God who is just like all of the other gods that they worshipped. And that's simply not going to suffice. Because such a way of approaching worship is never going to do because Yahweh is not a God like all of the other man-made gods. Now you can just hear all of the modern day responses to what's going on here. Because a modern day reading of this text would jump at the Israelites with cries of bigotry. I mean, who are these narrow-minded bigots who are telling these people of the land that they don't belong? I mean, how... Foolish! How foolish our world would say to these people. How intolerant, how hateful. This hate is only going to breed more hate. Who are these fools to say that these people of the land can't believe what they want to believe and do what they want to do and claim to worship the God that they claim to worship? I mean, if they say they worship Yahweh, doesn't that mean they worship Yahweh? Isn't that good enough? 
the short answer is no. It's not good enough. Listen, there is a reason that one of the primary concerns of the entire Bible is to call out the foolishness of false religion. And the reason is because in a fallen world, false religion is the norm. It's the default setting of the world. Just like when you get a fancy new iPhone and you open it up and it has its factory settings, the factory settings of our world are programmed because of sin to participate in, to love, to value, and even to create false religion to give purpose to the meaning of life. And that's what these enemies of the people of of Ezra were doing. They were not worshiping Yahweh. Because Yahweh is clearly revealing himself in the entirety of the scriptures to his people as something, as someone, as a God, a being who is totally different from creation. He is nothing like creation. He is not a created God. That's the entire claim of the entire Bible. See, in the Bible, the one true God reveals himself to us. He shows us who he is, and and he does that so that we can know his nature and ensure that we're worshiping him and not some other God of our own fabrication. So any time that you begin to deviate from who Yahweh has revealed himself to be in his word, you're no longer worshiping him. You're no longer worshiping Yahweh. And it doesn't matter how many times you say that you're worshiping Yahweh, if you're not worshiping him as he has revealed himself in the scriptures, then you're worshiping some other created God. You're doing exactly what the people of the land in Ezra's day were doing. And that's a problem Because Yahweh says that he is the one and only true God. And that there is no God but him. To turn turn Yahweh into another ancient Near Eastern God is to blaspheme his name. Listen to what commentator Dean Ulrich writes on this. The gods of the nations existed only in the minds of their adherents. They weren't real. They just existed in the minds of their adherents. And so... Their being and power were derived from the trust that people invested in them. They did not have independent being and power. Their gods did not transcend the natural world. Instead, they had births and deaths, and so were locked into the cycles of nature. They were just like everything else in nature. They were born somewhere. It was probably going to die somewhere. In short, the ancient Near Eastern gods were not holy or different, which contrasted with the Old Testament claims that Yahweh is holy. He is separate or distinct from all that he has made. Yahweh is different from everything else, including humans. Because he is self-existent and eternal. He depends on nothing outside himself. Everything else is created by, derived from, and dependent upon him. The post-exilic leaders did not want to compromise Yahweh's holiness by allowing false worship as the people of Israel had done in the past. They wanted to stay in Judah, and they wanted Yahweh in their midst. Therefore, they said no to interfaith cooperation that would dilute their witness to Yahweh's uniqueness. We have a lot to learn from these returned exiles and how they handled these people, don't we? Are you personally compromising the holiness of Yahweh in your own life? What what ideas from the false religion of this world are you mixing into your own life and worship, thus 
compromising the holiness of Yahweh and yourself in the process. You got to realize that syncretism is alive and well today, my friends. That, that, that's a practice of mixing religion to make religion into whatever you want it to be. Like you compromise it. This text reminds us that the one true religion of worshiping Yahweh is an exclusive religion. You're either all in or you're not in at all. You're either worshiping the God of my text or you're worshiping a different God. And that God's not a God. Jesus is the very manifestation of this claim. That's why he says in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Do you hear what Jesus just said in that text? I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Friends, all religions are not equally valid. There is one truth. There is one way. There is one path to life, and that is through the worship of Yahweh alone. And there in John, we see Jesus saying two astonishing words. He says, I am. Jesus says, I am. And those two words put emphatically together were an outrageous claim from Jesus. Because Jesus is saying in those two words that he is the God of the Old Testament scriptures. Because in Exodus 3, you may remember the story of Moses encountering Yahweh directly for the first time. And when Moses asks, asks God to reveal his name, show me who you are so that I can go and tell the people of Israel who sent me, God says to Moses, I am who I am. That's who God says he is. He said, say this to the people of Israel, Moses. I am has sent me to you. So when Jesus says, I am, that's not just him saying some passive phrase at the beginning of a sentence. That's him making a claim that I am the God that was worshipped by the people of Israel. I am Yahweh of the Old Testament, and you will only only come to the Father if you trust me as the way, the truth, and the life that can lead you to him. Jesus, even, is not part of the creation. He's not a created being. He is the reason that creation exists. And if you're not worshiping as that, you're not worshiping Yahweh. You're worshiping a created God. And if you want to come to God, friends, you can only come through Jesus. Jesus is reemphasizing the same thing that's going on in our text in Ezra. He, he is saying that you can only come to God through the pure worship of Yahweh. That Yahweh alone is the one who determines how his creation may dwell with him. And the way that we dwell with him is through his son, Jesus, alone. And you'll find yourself in big trouble if you try any other way to God. John Dyer, a Welsh poet and pastor from the 1700s, once wrote, wrote this. He said, a man may go to heaven without health, without riches, without honors, without learning, without friends, but he can never go there without Christ. Have you found Christ? The real Christ. Have you trusted in him alone? Or are you still just following the deadly GPS default route of this world that leads to death? I remember a few years ago hearing a story of a box truck delivery driver who plugged in his destination to a nearby city in the mountains of Colorado and started heading on his way. Before he knew it, he was driving up an old wagon trail, which is popular now as a Jeep 4x4 trail known as Ofer Pass, with a box truck. And he got the thing stuck. And there's just no way that this box truck was going to navigate this 
narrow, rocky pass with these gigantic cliffs, deadly drops on either side of the pass. So this, this guy got stuck, and it took hours to get a tow truck up there that could, could carefully back him down. And that's exactly what many people in this world are doing, my friends. They're blindly navigating according to the way of the world, thinking that they're going to reach their destination somehow in the end. But unfortunately, they don't realize that they're on the wrong path altogether. They're going to get stuck. And they're never going to make it to the destination unless they find the right path. And the only way to God is to know and to worship Yahweh, who Jesus refers himself to be, reveals himself to be in John 14. So I want to call you in church. This is for you too, because we know how quickly our hearts can get intermingled with this world to lay aside the false worship of riches. Lay aside the false worship of worldly security. Lay aside the false worship of family or of friends or of customs or of traditions because those things will never save you. Seek to know Yahweh and be entirely devoted to him. And you know how you do that? He made a way. He revealed himself to us in his word, his living word. That's why Jesus says, I've come and I've given them your word. I've shown them who you are. I've left them with your truth. I've left them with your word. And so we should be diving as his people into his word to see all the ways that we're tempted to start participating in this false worship and this idolatry again. That's what God's word does again and again to us. It carves away that fleshly part of us that remains, that wants to worship false things that will never satisfy, and it directs us back to Jesus, who is the only place that our satisfaction can be found. This is how we know, by God's word, this is how we know that we're not fabricating a false god and that we're worshiping the one and only true God. It's a good thing he left this to us. Otherwise, we could just make up whatever God we wanted. But we can't do that because we have his final and complete and sufficient word. But there's another important lesson here that I think is important, and that is that the work of God is the responsibility of of the people of God. The work of God is the responsibility of the people of God. These Jews are tasked with restoring the worship of Yahweh in the city of God. That's their job. Go back, build the temple, restore the worship of God in his place as his people. Build his city. And people who do not worship Yahweh, we see in this text, have no place in that work. Because as we mentioned, they need to worship Yahweh alone before they begin to do his work. And we just need to be really clear here. And I want to preface everything that I'm about to say by saying that I know that we have LDS friends in the room with us today. And I want you to know you are welcome and you're invited to be here. We, we want you to hear the way that we understand God's word. We want you to hear God's eternal and unchanging truth. In fact, we want you to believe it. And, and so just know this is a time where, where I'm speaking to our church. I'm equipping our church. And we are happy that you are here to listen in. Come down and talk with us at lunch if there's anything that you want to correct or set the record straight on. But we need to be clear on this point because we live in a place where 99.6% of the population around us are still trapped in a false religion, false worship. And 90% of those people adhere to the same expression of false religion. And that false religion does exactly what we see happening from the people of the land in this text. And that's exactly what false religion does. It just manifests itself with the same premise in different ways. But the people in this text, you notice, insist that they worship Yahweh. They insist that they do. I, 
we do worship the same God that you worship. And they will try to show all the sacrifices that they do to Yahweh to prove. Look at all the works. Look, this shows that we worship Yahweh. We do all these sacrifices. This proves that we worship Yahweh. But the truth is that they've exchanged the glory of the immortal God, the immortal God, the unchanging God, the God who never had a beginning and never has an end. They've, they've exchanged the true God to worship a God that's created in their likeness. They've made a God like them. Just like the false religion of the ancient Near Eastern world, we see this happening within the dominant religion here in the valley. You've probably heard the famous couplet by one of the LDS's former presidents, Lorenzo Snow, who famously said, as man now is, God once was, and as God now is, man may be. So on the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints website, there's an article that dives into this teaching and affirms it as the doctrine of the church. And, and it quotes from another former president of the church, Joseph Felding Smith, who commented on Snow's teaching, saying this, this is a doctrine which delighted President Snow, as it does all of us. Early in his ministry, he received by direct personal revelation the knowledge that, in the prophet Joseph Smith's language, God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man. Do you hear that? God is an exalted man. He's not holy. He's not other than. He's like us, but exalted, a man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. And that men have got to learn how to be gods. It's man's job. Learn how to be gods. The same as all gods have done before. Direct quote. And right after the closing of that quote on the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints website, it leaves with a final line of, this is indeed a dear doctrine of the church. This is not the worship of Yahweh, my friends. This is the worship of a created God. In fact, if you boil it down, it's really the worship of self. It's a desire to make man into God by making God just like man. Yahweh, who saves, is not like that. He is utterly distinct and different from us. That's what the word holy means. And Yahweh is holy, holy, holy. He's set apart from creation. And man only comes to know and worship him by knowing him and how he revealed himself through the prophets and through the apostles of old, not through people who claim to know him, though they have deviated from the 66 books in which he has revealed himself. And now here's why this matters for us, church. And this is where we get into the direct equipping for First Baptist Provo. You need to know that Yahweh, you need to know our God, you need to know who he is, so that you can clearly distinguish between the false gods that are worshipped in this world, including in this valley, from the true God of the Bible. Because everything hinges on that. If Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life, no one comes to the Father but through me, you better know who Jesus is. And if Jesus is saying that he is Yahweh, eternal God, existent from the beginning of time, never was anything before him, never would be anything after him, the eternal, self-sufficient God, and Jesus says, that's who I am, but you're worshiping something other than that, you've got the wrong God. 
And so we have to be able to see the difference between those things because there are always false gods, false religions, worldly ideologies being fed to us through a tube by Satan himself. Take this into your belly and believe it because it'll kill you. But you don't know it. It's sweet to the sweet to the taste at first. It'll kill you. So we need to be able to distinguish between the true God of the Bible and the false gods of this world. But secondly, we as a church must be a holy church that's fully devoted to, to Yahweh. And that's going to mean saying no to any religious group that wants to join together in some act of interfaith worship. You, you, you may not know this, but we actually have people all the time, neighbors around us, who are always reaching out to our church trying to see, can we get together and do some sort of worship service together? And we frequently have to just ask them, what God are we going to be worshiping? Because we, we have a different one here. We, we don't have the same Yahweh. We don't worship the same God. We, the, the God's a totally different nature, totally different past, totally different attributes. Even in the present, we don't have even remotely the same God. And so we have to frequently show people that, but we live in a context where this religious pluralism is everywhere. We all really worship the same God. Let's just get together and be happy and be friends and it'll all be good. And I'm not saying that we can't be friends. We are going to be friends. I love my neighbors. Love them. But I don't act like we worship the same God and I don't think that they should either. And so we can't get together and sing because we're singing to a different God. And, and you see here in this text that it is important that the people of God keep themselves pure when they are doing things that have direct connection to the worship of their God. These people are building the temple. They're working for their God, and people that don't worship Yahweh have no part in that. So if we want the presence of God in our church, just like these people wanted the presence of God in the land, we've got to remain a people who exalt his holiness, who don't start to water it down and diminish it through syncretism. Do you see what I'm saying, church? Y'all hear it, FBC Provo? And I am convinced that many churches are compromising to some degree here because they don't want to be labeled as anti-this or anti-that. And truthfully, those churches, I think, are compromising on the very text we're looking at this morning. You need to be clear on your distinction. You worship a different God. And if we want to be a holy people who are exalting our God in his place, we've got to be clear on that. There's a difference between false religion and true religion. But thinking and teaching this way, we need to be clear, doesn't make us anti-neighbor. Okay? And we need to see that clearly. We love our neighbors. We love them. And we believe that we're going to love them best by showing them who Yahweh really is. That's the aim. I was once an enemy of God. I was once far away. And by his grace, I've been brought near. And you can too. You can be brought near to know the God that I've come to know and love and trust and cherish and worship. You can be brought in to this city. You don't have to stay on the outside. The gates are open. The gate being Jesus himself, who is the door, is open. Go through him and worship our God. There's a lot that could be unpacked here. And maybe you have a lot of questions going around in your mind at this point. Well, can I do this? Can I do that? Come to lunch. <laughs> talk about it over lunch. We can talk about the application of the text together. Work through these things. There's a lot more that can be delved into here that we just don't have to, time to do right now. But right now we want to turn, now that we know who these enemies are, and I want to look at the efforts of the enemies, the efforts of the enemies. Now that we know who they are, let's look at how they respond to the holy people of God. Verses 4 and 5 and verse 24. You can look at it. I'm not going to read through those again. That's where we're getting this from. 
But in these verses, we see the response of the enemies to the returned exiles, rejecting their attempts to participate in the building of the city of God. How is this people going to respond when they say, no, 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 you're not one of us, and we're not going to mix that up. You're not one of us. How are they going to respond to that? And as we would expect, they were not happy about it. They weren't happy at all. We quickly see in verse 4, the people of the land began to discourage the people of Judah. And they sought to make them afraid to build by bribing counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. And that's what religious pluralists do when they're confronted with the exclusive claims of Christianity. <sighs> Idiots. <laughs> Foolish people. Bigots. Jerks. They want to water everything down and say that we're all the same. And so when they're confronted with Yahweh and with his people who say he is the one and only true God and you should worship him. And someday you will, whether you like it or not. Because the Bible tells us in Philippians 2, every knee will bow before Jesus. And every tongue will confess that he is Lord. The religious pluralists don't like that. And so they begin to bite and devour. They get angry. They mock. They scoff. They scorn. They laugh. They make faces. They snicker. They bite and devour. Oh, Jesus alone, Yahweh, true God, we're not in. And you can show them clear as day. This is a different God. And unless God moves in their hearts and reveals that to them, they respond exactly like these people respond. They begin to discourage the people of Judah. Now that word discourage carries a connotation of sinking. Isn't that interesting? They, they discouraged the people. They sought to sink the people. When, when the people of the land realized that they weren't going to be allowed to board the ship, they started throwing stones at it to try to sink it. In church, one sign of faithfulness to Yahweh in a world that's in rebellion against him is that the people of this world will try to sink the ship. I'm convinced that many churches don't experience the kind of attacks and discouragements of the world like this because they've cozied up to the world. And they've compromised the holiness of the worship of Yahweh themselves. Now, don't misunderstand me here. I don't want you to picture a church that's throwing stones at the world like a community of arrogant jerks. That's not the calling at all. A holy church is going to be a church that's filled with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control and it will be a church that guards sound doctrine and proclaims the truth of God in love. It will call people, the people of the land, the people who are in the position that all of us were in, it will call them to say, give up your false worship and come and worship the true Yahweh. This is the case even in Ezra, by the way. These people are invited, we see in 2 Kings 17, to become true worshipers of Yahweh. You're welcome to become a true worshiper of Yahweh. You're called to do so. Do it. But they refuse to do it. And instead, they try to sink the people of God who are doing the true work of God. But we see discouragement isn't enough. We see they also made them afraid to build by bribing those who were in power. They start to use scare tactics, and they seek to frustrate the purposes of God in the land. And sadly, what this text reveals to us is that the tactics worked. The tactics worked. The people got scared, and they pulled back, and they didn't do the work for many years. It's not your happy ending. Even the people of God we see in this situation became more jealous for their own protection and comfort than they were for the worship of their God. Can you relate? I mean, how often do we become discouraged and afraid in doing the work of the Lord in a world that hates him? How, how often are we silent when something false is being said about our God? How often do we grow tired and weary 
and simply want to give up on the work that God has called us to do. It happens all the time. And it happens because we forget who our God is and we forget who we are as his people. We take our eyes off of Yahweh and we put them on ourselves. And when we do that, it's no wonder that our confidence sinks to the depths of the sea because we're powerless to do the work of God on our own. We can't do it alone. We can't do it with our eyes on ourselves. Our eyes have to stay fixed on him. And the good news, friends, is that our God is not powerless. In fact, he's the opposite of powerless. Our God is all-powerful, and his people can overcome discouragement and fear in the world, not by force, but by faith in him. These people would have just kept their eyes on God. You don't see a single ounce of prayer in this text. How devastating. They just fear and give up and quit. No, if the people of God at this point would just see that our God did not come, our, rather, our God did come and actually did what his people failed to do. I, I, I often read about our Old Testament brothers and sisters like, I wish they could have seen the cross in hindsight like we can. Just think how that could have changed things for them. Because our God came and did what Israel failed to do. He faced down the enemy. And he did not grow discouraged or afraid. He did not grow weary of doing good. And his plans and purposes would not be frustrated. Church, do you know what you do when you're discouraged and afraid in the mission of God that he's called you to? Do you know what you ought to do? You look to Jesus and you find your hope in him. Because everywhere that you fail, he did not fail. And that's why your salvation can be found in him alone, by the way. Don't place your hope in your own ability to remain encouraged and brave in this world. Place your hope in his perfect work in your place. But there's a beautiful verse that serves as a major transition point, point in the Gospel of Luke. In fact, it's the point where you can say, well, the first half of Luke is here, and the second half of Luke is here. There's a pinnacle, a transition point. And the point of transition that Luke refers to is this is the beginning of his ministry, and this is the turning point of the narrative. And listen to what it says in Luke 9, 51. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. This verse draws from a prophecy of the perfect servant of the Lord in Isaiah 57 which says, but the Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced, therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. Church, Jesus came into the world to accomplish a mission, and that mission was to build the city of God for the people of God. Yeah, the Old Testament saints were failures. They needed Jesus. They gave up. They became discouraged. They became disheartened. Jesus came to establish the eternal city. And it would be a city made up of redeemed sinners who'd been saved by his sacrificial life and death and resurrection. And nothing would stop Jesus from accomplishing the mission that the Father had sent him into the world to accomplish. He set his face to go to Jerusalem. And the enemy would throw every stone that he could to sink Jesus's ministry. The enemies of God who were controlled by the power of Satan would do all that they could to turn his face away from Jerusalem, become discouraged, become upset, become fearful, give up. But Jesus's face would not be turned. He came to save his people and he was going to ensure that it was accomplished. And even as he entered Jerusalem and the greatest enemy of sin and death stood against him, he did his father's will and he went to the cross. And he hung on the cross and he absorbed all of the punishment for the sins of his people. He was building a city. He was gathering a people. He was making us holy so that we could enter into the presence of God one day ourselves. And he died in our place, but we know he didn't stay dead, people. Because on the third day, Jesus' eyes popped open in the tomb. 
And he was alive, raised up by God as a sign that the penalty for sin had been paid. The sacrifice had been accepted. No more sacrifices necessary. Perfect sacrifice done. Give yourself to him. Be saved by him. Be forgiven by him. Be covered by his blood. Come into relationship with him and be filled with the fullness of his presence. Sin has been defeated. And church, your greatest enemy, your greatest enemy was dealt the death blow by your Savior. Because in him, your sins are fully and completely forgiven. One day you're going to be standing before God and you're going to be declared righteous because you've been given the gift of Christ's righteousness by faith. His work, not yours. Rest in him. Love him. Worship him. That's the point. That's the point of the city. It exists to worship Jesus for what he's done for us. Turn with me. The last place we're going to turn just quickly. Romans 8. It's a beautiful text that says exactly everything I just said, but straight from the Bible. Romans 8, verses 31 to 39. Church, how do you deal with the opposition of Satan? How do you deal with the threats of the enemy? How do you deal with those who would scoff and seek to cast stones at the true people of God? Verse 31. What then shall we say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who's at the right hand of God. Who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Church, your confidence in standing tall in the mission of God is not rooted in your own ability or your own bravery or your own confidence. It's rooted in what's already been accomplished for you. Jesus died to deliver you from your sins. And the world needs to be shown that this truth that you hold so dear can be held dear by them as well so that they would be brought to worship this Yahweh God just like us. I mean, who wouldn't want to worship a God like this? Why would you choose anything else? Full and complete forgiveness by faith. Look to him and believe. There's no more people staring down at you saying, have you done all the commandments and ordinances that are required of you to gain access to God? He did it. Jesus did it. You can cast yourself on him. Why would you want to worship any God but Yahweh? He's the only God. But even just look at him and think, why would I worship anyone but him? He's amazing. I don't need any authority or ruler to stand in my way. Just go straight to him. Straight to Yahweh. The world church needs that message. They need to believe it. And so don't become disheartened and discouraged when the stones start getting thrown in your way. Just look to Christ and keep being faithful to build his city. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what you have done for us in, in Christ that we really can rest in you and love you 
And we can know peace and joy because of your love. God, I pray that as your people, we would, we would just be filled to the point of, of having to cry out glory. Glory to you. Lord, I pray that you would enable our church to stand as a city on a hill and to be bold and brave in the proclamation of your beautiful gospel. There's nothing better than knowing Jesus. Nothing. Lord, let us by your spirit be filled and overflowing with the knowledge of the truth of what you did to overcome the opposition for us so that we can stand fast in the oppositions that still come our way until the day when you deliver us finally and completely into your perfect city forever. I pray in Jesus' name.